What are we going to do today? We have a two-hour session where we would like to highlight and disseminate the key project findings that have, we have been working on. Um, yeah, on coupled effects of uh, and climate and land management <clears throat> um, options, uh, while offering a space for discussion of associated implications and assumptions in publications. We want to provide opportunities for feedback on remaining publications and review and um, preparation. Um, and we are also, um, yeah, we also want to go out and discuss, discuss further areas of interest in terms of future research related to land use and climate. We have a program which has also been shared with you. Um, currently, we are doing a short introduction. Um, I will next hand over to my colleague, Quentin Lejeune. Uh, Give you an overview of the, the project um, and co-development activities with stakeholders that we have done throughout the project. Some of you may be aware because you may have been involved, um, but I think it's it's important for everyone to kind of understand what our process was before we dive into results. Um, after Contama journey, we will have Florian Humpenlöder who will um, basically show the modeling um, of the co-developed scenarios so results that have been published in the paper as well. And there will be a Q&A <clears throat> which links to this process. And then in a second part, we want to divide into thematic breakout groups um, where you will hear one minute pitches from in the first session, two presenters and the second session, three presenters. And then you can choose yourself which breakout session you would you are interested in joining. Um, and there, the respective presenters will um, share, yeah, their their key findings, which are based on specific papers. In the end, we will have ten minutes uh, to wrap up and look out. Um, we will have a summary, um, yeah, remaining results uh, to be published and. Uh, related projects will be presented and this will be done by my colleague Quentin Jane. And I think this is already all from my side. With this I would I don't know and I get to shortly present to you the the two sessions as well. So in the first session we will have uh, Stephen De Hertog from EUB in Brussels um, who will talk about local and non-local biogeophysical effects in idealized earth system model simulations. And we have Suchi Guo, who's at LMU in Munich, and she will talk about local and remote impacts of land cover and land management change on the climate and carbon cycle. <clears throat> in session two, as said, we have three presenters. We have Michael Windisch, who is based at ETH in Zurich. He will talk about climate change mitigation by forests, incorporating local temperature considerations. We have Anton Olaf, who is based at CISOWO uh, in Norway. He talks about effects of changes in land cover and management on health and labor productivity. And last but not least, we have Shruti Nath, who is based at Climate Analytics in Berlin. And she will talk about uh, speeding up climate modeling with emulators, inclusion of land use effects and other development. And with this, I think I can hand over to Quentin. Thank you, Inga. I hope you can hear me well. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where you are. Um, yeah, so I'm Quentin Lejeune. I'm working in climate analytics and I was um, coordinating the, the LAMA Clima project, LAMA Clima stands for Land Management for Climate Mitigation and Adaptation. And I will today, present a recap of the project, what we were trying to achieve during the project, what we, what kind of expertise were uh, present in the consortium, as well as what kind of outputs we were, we were developing, <clears throat> with a focus also on some um, stakeholder engagement activities that we have conducted. And that will lead you to the next presentation by Florian Umpenöder on um, how the, the scientific results that uh, were um, uh, produced using um, a, a, a land use allocation model called MAGPI as a result of this stakeholder engagement activity. So um, to start with, as I said, I would um, 
first um, show the project objectives. So, um, <clears throat> so there were dual two objectives, two main objectives. The first one being to advance the scientific and public understanding of the coupled effects between the change in land cover and land management and the climate. So because there are uh, still a lot of uncertainties um, on how yeah uh, how uh, how these two um, are coupled, so how climate is influenced by changing in land use, uh, but also land management, and, and the opposite as well. But also on how these effects of changes in land cover and land management on climate, how they then impact um, natural systems such as um, water availability, for example, but also human systems, including the economy. And so we were trying the consortium to actually bring this community, different community together to to um, investigate those questions. A second objective was to help elaborate land-based adaptation and mitigation measures that help achieve the objectives of the Paris Agreement and the sustainable development goals. The land sector is obviously um, a sector that contributes a lot to carbon emissions, but also a key sector to actually um, reduce carbon emissions. And it's also obviously a key sector to um, help achieve sustainable development goals. And we were trying to um, address this a bit in the project. So, uh, okay, so then a short overview of the consortium. Uh, we had several partners, actually seven scientific institutions were present in this consortium, and we were trying to cover different components. So the first component was actually um, trying to investigate the biophysical responses to changes in land cover and land management. And it's something that we also call LCLM and suggest that you note down this acronym because we use it several times, I think, in this in this uh, presentation, but also in the, in the upcoming presentations. So looking at these um, responses using models that we call Earth system models that can represent uh, very um, accurately and depict a lot of the processes that control the Earth system. There were there are um, different um, uh, partners that were part of this effort, um, VU in Amsterdam, Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, LMU, ETH Zurich, and um, VUB in Brussels. And the results of this um, exercise was actually feeding into a second component, which was the investigation of the consequences of these responses, biophysical responses to changes in LCLM uh, for uh, macroeconomic variables. And this is something that um, partners in, from Cicero in Norway were looking at, but also on land use patterns using um, a specific model called MAGPI, which was um, used by our partners at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, OPIC. All of this was actually feeding into stakeholder engagement activities, and I will talk a bit more about this um, in, a, in a minute, um, in particular, some webinars, public webinars that were held towards the beginning of the project. And we were also having, um, together with stakeholders, some co-design activities, which I will also present um, in a minute. Both the components on the left were actually, um, oh, no, sorry, the, the biophysical responses to changes in LCLM uh, actually was uh, taken up, the, these results were taken up by another component, which was led by Climate Analytics, as well as ETH Zurich, to um, further develop a nerve system model emulator. And you will learn also, um, if you um, join the presentation by shooting at later, you will learn more about what actually emulators are, but simply they are simple models for that represent the processes in nerve system models. And um, the, um, the purpose of this project, one of the purpose was to further develop a nerve system model emulator that also includes um, the effects, the coupled effects between land use and climate investigated in this first component. After this, um, I mentioned that there have been some scenario co-design activities together with stakeholders in this stakeholder engagement component, and the results have actually been taken up by our partners, principally from Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, OPIC, to model resulting land use patterns for the scenarios that were co-developed, as well as resulting emissions using the MAGPI model. This will be the topic of the next presentation after I'm done with um, presenting to you uh, the last component, um, which is um, 
the investigation of the implications of the co-developed scenarios that were modeled with the MAGPI model here for adaptation and mitigation and SDGs using us 10 models. And this um, was or is being done still with by our partners from L Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, um, Free University of Brussels and Cicero mostly. Um, so I said I would say a few words about the stakeholder engagement activities that we have conducted as well um, during this project. So here is a slide that shows you um, <clears throat> the topics of a public webinar that we held on May and June 2020. Three lectures of one and a half hours each, focusing on the future of land cover, land management, and climate change. We have two speakers, two speakers as well about the effect of irrigation and climate change, as well um, for the last uh, webinar of a series on forest management and land cover change and the changing climate. And the recordings are accessible um, on this page here, so the project web page, and um, they are stored on, you, on our YouTube channel. Then, as I mentioned, another important activity from the stakeholder engagement component was actually to co-develop some scenario narratives. And now we spend a few slides to explain how this was done, um, because um, I think this is an interesting exercise to actually advertise and share how this was done, but also because it was actually feeding directly into some research that was done and that would be presented afterwards by our, our uh, colleague Florian Umponodor from PIC. So the participants of this scenario development exercise were constituted of two groups. There were consortium members, so mostly scientists from the Lama Klima project with diverse profiles reflecting the different components I've mentioned before, as well as five to 10 land use experts with diverse background that were external to a project. Some coming from academia, some from environmental consultancies, from international organizations, from European agencies, as well as governmental bodies. Um, the objectives of this scenario development exercise were first to identify some scenario narratives considered of, of interest and broad policy relevance to the stakeholders, which reflect different ways to meet both the climate and environmental policy objectives and would result in different evolutions of land use across the world. But second, because we wanted this to be actually also feeding into some um, science being done in the consortium, we wanted to identify how the narratives that were developed in this first objective could be implemented in the MAGPI model, which will also be presented um, in the next presentations, while um, retaining the characteristics of their distinct essences. So how could we develop some scenario that would feed into this first objective, but that can be implemented in MAGPI? Um, the co-development took place between February and April 2021. It was constituted of the process was that we held three online webinars of one and a half hours, where we mostly the consortium members um, gave some input to the participants from that were external to the consortium. And then we had a um, 10 hour workshop focusing on tele scenario co-development over two days in April 2021. So consortium scientists, um, on the one hand, would list the processes that the models used in the Lama Klima project can represent and the types of questions that they can help answer. And on the other hand, the so-called stakeholders, so external to the consortium, were among these processes and they were listing aspects that they found of potential interest in policy relevance and worth considering in the scenario narratives. And so, and um, then there were several iterations between the two groups um, where they um, then after stakeholders are listed aspects, then consortium scientists would again maybe clarify some aspects, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So there were several of these iterations that happen over time in order to re achieve a common ground and um and arrive at yes, so scenario narratives that were both um, um of interest to the stakeholders but also implementable in Magpie. So these iterations were useful to, to get to know the objectives um, and boundary conditions of the code development process, but also each other's interest and domain of expertise. This is a picture that um, show you, yeah, a um, screenshot from a robot that we used for the scenario code development uh, workshop. 
so on the top you can see just like some of the input that was given by Costa Sanchez with uh, some fancy plots and maps um, that everyone could refer to at any time and below you can see a lot of tags and um, and um, and arrows going in different directions with a lot of different ideas put, put on sticky notes um, in which we were trying to to um, summarize in the end in this table which um, I will also uh, or I think Florian will also show in his presentation. So in the end, the scenario narratives, they reflect the necessity to find a common ground between um, a long list of aspects of potential policy relevance and interest with stakeholders, um, the more limited possibility to represent these aspects in the models using the project, and then the desire to derive scenario narratives for which the corresponding land use trajectories and impacts on both the carbon cycle and the climate by, via biogeophysical effects and you will learn more about this term in, in one of the following presentations, whether um, scenario narratives exhibit enough differences so that when they are modeled with the models that we use in a project, um, we are able to draw robust scientific conclusions. And also, of course, um, the narratives reflect the regions of highest interest for stakeholders, which come from EU and OECD countries, mostly, and the modeling capabilities of the MAGPI model, which is divided into F regions. As a result, we end up with two scenarios, one which we call global sustainability, and another one global inequality. So in a global sustainability scenario, the whole world would follow a path towards sustainable development, enabling the achievement of climate and environmental objectives. So following the first objective, um, of um, this um, of the um, of the scenario co-development effort, um, and in both cases, we wanted to have scenarios that were fulfilling these climate and environmental objectives in the OECD plus EU countries, given the regions of high interest for stakeholders. But in the second scenario, we actually see uh, widening inequalities between these OECD ninety countries plus EU. Um, Although which emphasis is put on achieving sustainability objectives locally, so essentially the same as in the first scenario, but in all of the countries, these objectives are not met in order to, the idea was really to see how um, this difference, what impact it would have according to the MAGPIE model eventually on land use pattern and land use emissions. As a last step, we identified the parameters or options in the MAGPIE model that would allow us to actually code or implement this scenario into MAGPIE. And these choices were validated in an additional online meeting a few months later. Um, yeah, so, um, and I'm back to this, um, to this slide, which you know now well, and focusing on these three less components. And here, are the results of the scenario code design activity, which I developed, um, talked about now, have been implemented in the MAGPIE model, as said, and then afterwards, um, the land use patterns and emissions that were produced by the MAGPIE model were used and investigated. Their implications were investigated using assisted models again. Now the research outputs presented today, as I mentioned, Florian will start with presenting the outputs um, of the MAGPIE modeling, looking at um, the implications of a scenario code level um, scenario narratives that were co-developed for land use patterns and emissions. Then we'll have biophysical responses to change in land cover land management by Steven and Suchi. And eventually, Michael, Anton, and Shruti will cover three of um, different components. With this, um, I think it's time to let give a floor to Florian, who will present the results of the modeling for co-developed scenarios. Good afternoon or good morning. My name is uh, Dr. Florian Hoppenöder. I work at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research in the Department for Transformation Pathways. And yeah, thanks, Kotov, for basically setting the scene and already introducing um, the narratives of the scenarios that have been developed in, in the LAMA Klima project and also that they have been quantified of the MAGPIE model. That's basically what I will show in this talk. 
So as mentioned already, the results that I'm going to present, they have been published in a high-ranking peer-reviewed peer open access journal in Nature Communications. So um, I can also paste the link in, in the chat. So it's open access, so everyone should have um, yeah, access to it immediately. And it's entitled, Overcoming Global Inequality is Critical for Land-Based Mitigation in Line with the Paris Agreement. But before I go into the detail of how we actually parametrized and quantified those scenarios, let me briefly expand on the motivation for the two scenarios that have been introduced in the first talk. So first of all, there are basically three um, yeah, arguments for looking into such scenarios, comparing a world of global sustainability versus global inequality. First of all, um, as mentioned already, the emissions from agriculture, forestry, and other land use, that means from the land use sector, um, are especially high in low and middle income countries. In total, AFULO accounts for about 21% of, um, of total anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. And this figure here on the right hand side, which is taken from the IPCC AR6 Working Group 3, shows um, how those um, emissions from the land use sector are composed. So the biggest component, about 50%, are emissions from land use change. That means deforestation, conversion of other land types. The second largest component are methane emissions from enteric fermentation, followed by nitrous oxide emissions from soil and, and managed soils and pastures, followed by some smaller components. If we look at the regional picture, which is shown here in figure B, we immediately see that CO2 emissions from land use change, but also from enteric fermentation are especially high in Africa, Latin America, and also Sub-Saharan Asia. The second reason is that um, also the mitigation potential for um, a full greenhouse gas emissions is especially high in Africa, Asia, and, and Latin America. But this figure is again taken from the AR6 Working Group 3 report. And it shows um, different potential estimates of um, mitigating a full greenhouse gas emission. So it shows a technical potential, which is the, the largest um, potential. It shows an economic potential. And um, it shows um, a second potential derived with the help of integrated assessment models. Um, but the overall picture is that um, especially CO2 emissions from deforestation which are these reddish colors here, but also CO2 uptake due to re and afforestation, that this potential is especially high in, in Asia, Latin America, and also Africa. But also the non-CO2 emission mitigation potential is especially high in Asia. Last but not least, there are also very high challenges for actually implementing such measures to yeah to arrive at um yeah the, the the reduction of emissions from agriculture forestry other land use in low and middle income countries so this um, box you see here with the dashed blue line that's directly taken from the AR6 uh, summaries of for policymakers stating that mitigation investment gaps are wide for all sectors and widest for the afulu sector in relative terms and for developing countries also, in addition, if we broaden this a bit to like going beyond climate, also looking into SDGs, there is research finding that also the financing needs for key SDG areas such as health, education, and food security are especially high in low and middle income countries. All right, coming now to um, the two contrasting narratives, global inequality versus global sustainability, which you see here highlighted. Um, I highlighted these two because we also um, quantified three yeah, in-between versions where only certain elements of the scenarios were activated. But in this talk, I will focus on the two main scenarios. These two scenarios are basically composed by assumptions in three different domains, domains which is a full of greenhouse gas emission pricing, sustainable land use practices, and social economic drivers and dietary change. And I will yeah, guide you, explain um, what this means. 
The overall idea is that in global sustainability, these three dimensions are yeah, active, assumed at the global level. So that means, for instance, in the case of a full greenhouse gas emission pricing, that there is yeah, a global um, comprehensive, globally comprehensive emission pricing scheme for all emissions in the land use sector. This is, of course, very idealized because in reality, um, we are not even close to getting there, but that's basically also reflecting the most ambitious um, sustainability scenarios that you can find also in the AR6 um, Working Group 3 report. There are like these illustrative mitigation pathways and also one um, which is called sustainable um, development, and that's close to, to this um, scenario. Whereas in the global inequality scenario, we assume that a full of greenhouse gas emissions are only priced in OECD 90 plus EU, that means only in high income countries. Same goes for sustainable land use practices. So global implementation in the sustainability scenario, but only in OECD 90 plus EU in the global inequality scenario. So what does this actually mean? So this is composed, which you can see below here in the table three, also highlighted in blue. So it means that it includes more ambitious land protection schemes. FF stands for frontier forests plus biodiversity hotspots in addition to already existing um, land protection uh, measures. Then there is an assumption to, of um, cropland that is set aside in managed landscapes. So in, in managed cropland, this is basically the idea is to, to increase um, the, the biodiversity and the heterogeneity within managed landscapes. Then water environmental flows are protected in the sustainability scenario. Animal waste management is um, improved and also the fertilizer efficiency is improved. Finally, the socioeconomic drivers and dietary change. Here we have yeah, two consistent um, assumptions for population and GDP and, and further drivers. And this is um, taken from the SSP4 scenario, which is an inequality scenario in itself for the global inequality scenario. And uh, for the global sustainability scenario, this is largely based on the SSP1 population and GDP. Plus, in addition, we assume that there will be a transition to the Eat Lancet planetary health diet by 2050 in combination with lower food waste. All of this has been implemented and modeled with the MAGPI land use model. It's an open source model. So that means you can go to this link and, and download the model and play around with it if you want. So it has a yeah, multi-regional um, focus. So it's divided into 12 world regions, which cover the whole world. And it has a detailed representation of food demand and agricultural production and can run yeah, scenarios based on SSP2 until the end of the century. And quite important, especially for this project, it can also come up with spatially explicit land use patterns for all the scenarios that are produced. This slide summarizes the main scenario drivers and assumptions for the two scenarios. So we see here in figure A how population develops over time in the different world regions indicated by the color coding. And what we can see is at first glance that yeah, global inequality has a much higher increase um, in population, especially in, in sub-Saharan Africa, which is here the, the pink color. In terms of income, we see a divergence between the world regions by assumption, whereas they yeah, come closer in the global sustainability scenario. Per capita calorie intake converges to, to healthy levels based on the transition to the Eat Lancet diet and global sustainability, whereas they follow um, yeah, current trends in the global inequality scenario. So taking together, population income per capita calorie intake gives us the total demand for crops and livestock, which is then like the main driver for the MAGPI model. And here we already see an important result because 
in global inequality, we see an increasing demand for food uh, crops and livestock products um, by summing up all the world regions. That means it likely cannot be produced um, on the existing agricultural land. Whereas in global sustainability, we see that this demand is declining, meaning that um, it's likely that land could be freed up and repurposed, um, for instance, for your afforestation. In addition, we also have derived two indicators um, for, for health. Um, so this is um, yeah, the prevalence of, of underweight, which is um, by assumption phased out in global sustainability and along the same lines, the prevalence of obesity, which would strongly increase in global inequality is, um, is vanishing in the global sustainability scenario. All right, we have now talked a lot about the land use patterns and yeah, here they are. So this shows on the right-hand side, the global land use patterns, global land use change compared to 2020 over time for various land types for the two scenarios. So what we can see here is that in global inequality, we see increasing cropland for, for food crops, but also increasing cropland for bioenergy. And we see more timber plantations and afforestation. And that happens yeah, at the cost of pasture areas, but also substantially um, at the loss of, at the cost of secondary forest and also primary forest and also other natural land. This is contrasted by the global sustainability picture where we see um, that actually the, at the global level cropland is declining. Um, also pasture land is declining. That's mostly an effect of the transition to the eat lancet diet um, while no forests are lost. So looking at the bottom, we see a regional breakdown just for the year 2100, so just a time slice, but uh, differentiated into the different regions. And here we can basically see which regions are driving those global patterns. And um, in global inequality, this is made mostly um, Sub-Saharan Africa, where cropland is strongly increasing, um, which is happening at the cost of, of forests. So we see a lot of deforestation because of cropland expansion. Um, whereas in global sustainability, this is prevented by the price that is assumed on CO2 emissions from land use change. And instead, so there is no forest loss, but there is, in addition, more re afforestation. This slide shows um, one of the main outcomes of the study. It shows the um, global greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, forestry, and other land use from Afolu in terms of CO2 emissions from land use change, uh, methane emissions from enteric fermentation and rice, and nitrous oxide emissions from, from soils and fertilizer application. And it's the same setup as on the slide before. So this is the global picture over time. And here we have a regional breakdown just for year 2100. So what do we see here? We basically see that in global inequality, the Afolu greenhouse gas emissions would remain at quite high levels throughout the century. So the net effect over all gases indicated here by this black line. So it, it means in this scenario, we would not see net zero or net negative greenhouse gas emissions from the land use sector. Um, so especially the non-CO2 emissions remain high. The CO2 emissions are at a global level almost zero, but that's only a net effect of negative emissions in high income countries and positive CO2 emissions from deforestation from Sub-Saharan Africa. In global sustainability, we see a strong reduction of all emission types, especially also of the non-CO2 emissions. Um, and we see much more negative emissions, basically in all regions from re and afforestation, which would then yeah, bring down um, emissions, the net um, emissions um, below the, the gray line, which here uh, indicates um, 1.5 degree compatible emissions taken from the AR6 database. 
we have not only looked into land use patterns and emissions, but we also looked at additional variables that could be linked, can be linked to the SDGs, to the Sustainable Development Goals. So we also looked into forest area as a yeah, proxy or estimator for um, SDG 15. And here the results are shown for year 2050 um, for all the scenarios. And we can see that, um, yeah, especially the greenhouse gas pricing scenario, but also sustainable demand, they would strongly increase the, the forest area. Also, um, there is um, a quite positive effect of environmental protection, that means sustainable um, land use practices on nitrogen fixation, which is a proxy for nitrogen losses to the environment. So this would be reduced by 23% um, compared to the um, global inequality scenario. And overall, if we look at emissions, which are shown here again on the, on the left-hand side, we see yeah, that the emission reduction in global greenhouse gas price and global sustainable demand are comparable if you sum it up over all the greenhouse gases, um, but only the sustainable demand that means scenario, means the scenario with the transition to the eat lancet diet and lower food waste has also co-benefits in terms of nitrogen losses um, and also agricultural water use. Because you can see here that for the greenhouse gas price scenario is actually a trade-off in terms of water use. So this would be higher. Um, and also in terms of nitrogen fixation. So to sum up, um, we have seen that low and middle income countries, they have relatively high Afulu greenhouse gas emissions and play a quite important role in 1.5 degree transformation pathways. But there are high challenges for the implementation of Afulu mitigation measures in such countries. So we found that if sustainable development in the Afulu sector would remain limited to high income countries only, global Afulu greenhouse gas emissions would remain substantial throughout the 21st century. So that's what I showed on the emission slide. Therefore, we conclude that overcoming global inequality is critical for land-based mitigation in line of the Paris Agreement. And what we also found is that especially inclusive socioeconomic development in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia is a key enabling factor for a full greenhouse gas mitigation with co-benefits for other sustainable development goals. So this was the content part. Um, we also developed a interactive web-based tool for exploring the scenario outcomes, which is um, available at this link, which I will post at the end of my talk. And it shows the same figures. So it's yeah, it's a, it's a web tool and it shows the same figures as in the paper, but it's dynamic version. So you have like hover effects. If you go off the mouse, um, it will be highlighted in all the figure panels and um, there will be a pop-up window that shows the exact numbers. And there's also on the right-hand side, which is not shown here, there's like a tab of the raw data where you can filter and search. All right. Um, as already mentioned, the land use patterns that have been derived um, from these two scenarios, they are um, have been yeah, processed by the LUH2 team to make them available for the ESMs, for the Earth system models within this project. So they were post-processed and then also harmonized to derive a consistent history to future land use data set. And yeah, it has been taken up by, um, by the ESM teams in this project. And some of these ESM applications will be presented in the following breakout sessions. All right, I will. Here, just a little bit of the background to why we want to look at uh, these effects in earth system model simulations. Uh, as you know, land cover change plays a large role in the carbon cycle. Uh, you heard a lot of talk about emissions from the AFOLU sector before. Uh, and we know that this is important and we need to study and understand this. However, land cover change can also cause effects on the water and energy cycle. And these are typically called biogeophysical effects in literature. And what is so annoying about these biogeophysical effects is that there is a large uh, intermodal uncertainty. 
You could say this is also the case for the carbon cycle. But with the carbon cycle, we all agree that deforesting uh, forests, at least over the tropics, will have a negative effect on our climate, will cause a warming. While in the biogeophysical effects, there's still also a lot of uncertainty regarding the sign of the temperature change that would be caused. So that's why we want to look at this uh, in this project, since you have multiple models. And to better understand and try to inform uh, policies as land can indeed play a critical role for future mitigation adaptation strategies, as you've seen before. Uh, and so to inform future policy making, like for example, the European Green Deal, where a lot of afforestation is included, we want to understand these effects better. So to do that, oh yeah, just a little, little more background on these biogeophysical effects. Uh, I was talking about that the sign can sometimes change across different models. This is because they are, they are compounds of different uh, sub processes, let's say, that have different roles. Uh, for example, some of these processes can cause a cooling. As you see here on the left, if you deforest, you can cause a decrease, uh, uh, sorry, an increase in the local albedo, so a brightening of the surface which will increase the amount of uh, solar radiation being reflected and thus causing a local cooling. On the other hand, the deforestation can also cause a local warming by changing the way energy is partitioned at the surface and uh, through evaporation efficiency or through roughness changes. And these generally leads to a warming. And the balance between these three processes is generally what determines whether uh, your deforestation will cause a biogeophysical warming or a biogeophysical cooling. Now, how did we try to analyze this? We used some sensitivity experiments with uh, different Earth system models. We started with a base, a control simulation, let's say, which was under fixed 2014 uh, fossil fuel emission forcings and land cover forcings. So it's really a simulation representing the year of 2014, but constantly throughout that 160 year period to really get a benchmark of what is, let's say, present day climate like. Then within that present day climate simulation setup, we changed land cover and land management to see what the effects of these uh, things were. We did one global reforestation simulation where we planted trees everywhere. We did a global cropland simulation where instead of planting trees, we took away all the trees and changed everything to cropland. And then we did two other simulations where we focused more on management. So on top of the global forest simulation, we applied extensive wood harvesting to see how wood harvesting affects the climate. And on top of the global cropland simulation, we applied extensive irrigation to see what the effects of irrigation were. And so all of these simulations have been done with three Earth system models, the MPI ESM, the Community Earth System Model, and EC Earth. So using these simulations, we can then extract the signal or the effect on the climate. And this is done by comparing temporal averages over uh, across the different models and between the different simulations. Uh, so one of these effects is the signal of afforestation, which we can get from comparing the forest to global forest world to the control world. Then again, we can also use this forest world to extract the effect from wood harvesting by comparing wood harvesting to the forest simulation. Then uh, we can also affect, have the effect of deforestation or in our case, rather cropland expansion by planting crops everywhere. And this is by comparing the cropland world to the control world. And finally, this cropland world can also be used to compare against the irrigation world to get the effects of global irrigation. And so these signals, these effects on the climate can then be analyzed and attributed to a specific land cover or land management change in a specific location. So that's a bit the goal of our simulations. However, there's one additional peculiarity about these simulations, and that's that uh, we try to separate between a local effect and a non-local biogeophysical effect. And to do that, we use the checkerboard approach. Now, first, to describe what a local and a non-local effect are, a local effect is an effect that's directly caused by the changes in surface properties within the location of the land cover change. And so this is only visible within that location and not anywhere nearby where no land cover change occurred. While we, of course, know that there are winds, there is advection, and there might even be circulation changes. And so these effects could have uh, could change the climate in locations where no land cover change occurs. These, these are generally the non-local effects 
And from previous literature, we saw that local and non-local effects can be strongly different and have strongly different processes driving them, as, for example, the map is showing here on the left. That's why we apply this checkerboard pattern, which you can see on the right, a simple checkerboard. Everybody knows black, white, black, white. And what we actually do is we do not do a full land cover change, as I had described before. As I'm illustrating here for the case of deforestation, on the left, you see the control land cover map, which is the regular map. This is the spread of forest currently around the world. And on the right, you see our crop simulation land cover map. So we deforested, like I said before, we did a idealized deforestation, but we only did this on one out of two out of one out of two out of every pixel in the world. So in a checkerboard pattern, only the white ones, not the black ones. And in that way, we can make a clear distinction between what is local, what is only seen where land cover change occurs, and what is non-local, what is also occurring where no land cover changes occur. So that's all for the background. Let's start looking into some results now. Forgot one slide, <laughs> not yet the results. First, we have also the land cover and land management changes that are, are the end used. So here, this is just an overview slide where you have the three different earth system models in the columns and the different uh, comparisons, which I talked about in the rows. So cropland expansion at the top, forest expansion, uh, forestation, uh, in the second row, irrigation expansion on the third row, and wood harvesting on the last row. I show these maps to clearly illustrate that even though we used uh, an idealized and tried to make it coherent across the different models, you see that there is actually quite strong differences even across the rows. So you see that in different earth system models, the land cover changes and the land management changes have been implemented in different ways. And this, of course, influences the results, which I will get to in a bit. So first of all, the first thing that we try to do uh, in this analysis is to evaluate. We are, of course, running earth system models, which are models, which are not the reality. So we try to benchmark them against observational data. Here we compare this against a range of studies, which I'm citing here on the slide, generally derived from satellite observations and uh, in situ observations. And here, this is an evaluation for surface temperature for full deforestation. So here, the way we evaluate this is we look at the local effect for crop minus forest. And on the left, you see our main evaluation plot. The three colored lines are the three different earth system models and the gray shading gives the observational range of where we think this should be overall you see that the earth system models are able to grasp the general patterns there is quite some diversity but also in in the observations themselves uh, but in general they get us the message that it's a warming over most of the latitudes mainly over the tropics and a cooling towards the boreal latitudes some models do this better than the others. For example, EC Earth does not show this cooling in boreal latitudes. And CSM, for example, already shows the cooling from the mid latitudes onwards instead of only uh, from boreal latitudes. So you see specific models have specific biases, but in general, the models are able to capture physical trends that we know are there. Now, if we look at the signal separation that I mentioned before, so this local versus non-local comparison. Here I'm showing the results for cropland expansion. So planting crops anywhere uh, compared to our present day land cover world. I'm again showing the three different earth system models in the rows. So the upper row is CSM, the middle row MPISM, and the bottom row EC Earth. And the left row, the left column, I apologize, is the local effect. The middle column is the non-local effect. And then at the right, you see the total effect with the latitudinal plots next to them. So what we clearly see from this cropland expansion experiments is that the local effects are actually quite consistent across each other, across the different earth system models. We see a warming over the tropics and a cooling over boreal latitudes. The magnitude and, and somehow the spatial spread is a bit different at some locations, but you have generally consistent patterns. If we then look at the non-local effects, you actually see that this consistency is nowhere to be found. We have a very clear global cooling in CISM, while in MPISM, you even have a warning. So you see clearly that there's much more uncertainty embedded within these known local effects than there is in these lo local effects, which we understand better and which we evaluated in the previous slide. Now, moving on to another land cover change, we have afforestation here. Again, the same structure of plots, so local effects on the left, non-local effects in the middle, and then total effects and latitudinal effects on the right. 
Uh, and so here, as you might expect, the effects from afforestation are generally the inverted ones from those of deforestation. We have a cooling over the tropics in the local effects, while we have a warming over the boreal latitudes. And again, the local effects are roughly consistent. You see some differences, like for example, here it's very clear that in EC Earth, there is very little warming going on in the boreal latitudes, while this is very clear in the other models. Now, in contrast to cropland expansion, we see that for our afforestation simulations, actually, the non-local effect is consistent. And we see a global warming everywhere. Now, I did not describe the processes too much before. I might still go into it later. But here, this, this global non-local effect is mostly because of the increased albedo of a forest. A forest is a darker surface. And especially over, over boreal latitudes, this will mask the, the snow that could possibly be there over winter and will just be much darker and which cause a warming in that way. And that is actually what is driving this non-local effect. Uh, so yeah, that's all I want to say about afforestation. Then moving on to irrigation expansion. Again, the same structure of plot. The global picture is that we see a cooling. We see a cooling due to irrigation in each of the models, except for EC Earth. Now, the reason for that is actually because in EC Earth, irrigation is not modeled to influence the climate. The irrigation parameterization they use in this Earth system model does not connect its water cycle to the atmosphere. And therefore, it will not change evaporation, which is the main mechanism through which irrigation causes a cooling. The only changes in climate that we see in East Europe are actually due to enhanced greening of the crops. So slight changes in the albedo properties, but not in the water cycle. And that's why in East Europe we actually have no change. So here we can ignore East Europe for a bit. And if we look at MPIism and CSM, we see cooling is consistent. But the big difference is whether this cooling is generally local or non-local. In MPIism, you see a very large non-local cooling occurring which is mainly uh, linked to large atmospheric changes, circulation changes, and changes in cloudiness in that Earth system model. So the sign of change is consistent, but what is driving the change differs across the different Earth system models. Now, what finally drives these local effects? Here I'm uh, showing a summarizing plot where I'm showing the three different Earth system models on the columns and the Three different cases I've been talking about on the row. So cropland expansion on the top row, afforestation on the middle row, and irrigation expansion on the last row. And so the colors in these plots, the line indicates the changes in temperature, these latitudinal uh, changes of the local temperature effects that I've been talking about before. And the different colors indicate different driving variables, where the light green is latent heat flux, the dark green is sensible heat flux, orange is the albedo effect, and then you also have the effects of short wave and long wave radiation show. I won't go too much into detail, but in general, what you see is that except over some cases, like for example, in boreal latitudes for uh, cropland expansion and afforestation, you actually see that turbulent heat flux effects are the ones who dominate uh, the temperature response, especially for irrigation expansion, but also over most areas of the globe uh, for cropland expansion and afforestation. So, now, I think I still have some time, so I will quickly also talk a bit about the effects on moisture. Here, I'm showing the effects on precipitation. And do note that uh, since this is actually part of a different publication than the previous plots, the structure is slightly different. So now the Earth system models are on the rows, CSM, MPIism, and EC Earth. And the cases, so the cropland expansion, afforestation, and irrigation expansion are on the columns. In general, you see that there are quite strong changes and differences across the Earth system models for precipitation in our simulations. But you do can still disentangle some specific patterns. Like, for example, there is the crop expansion case. So in the first column, you generally see a drying over land. This is not the case in every region. Uh, or there's also some, for example, in Ethiopia, there is some mesoscale uh, circulation changes going on, a very localized scale. Uh, but the general tendency is there that most areas show a drying. And this is in contrast to afforestation and irrigation expansion, the ones on the right, where you generally see a wettening over land, so an increase in the amount of precipitation due to the changes in these land covers. So the general picture is that there are strong regional differences, but that there are some consistencies if you look at the global patterns. Now, 
these precipitation effects are interesting, but how, how does this relate to the local level? How does this affect the moisture recycling, actually? That's what I'm looking at here. Uh, moisture recycling, for those who don't know, is uh, how, how strongly the feedback is between evaporation and, and precipitation at a local scale. So will local evaporation feed precipitation in that location or not? If yes, it has a strong moisture recycling. If no, it has no moisture recycling in that location. I calculated the metric for that, which you can see on the top uh, line there across the different models, where the more intense, the more dark colors show a more intense uh, recycling across the different models. Again, the models are the different columns. And what you immediately see is that there is actually a very strong difference in the importance of moisture recycling across the three different models. Where in CSM, moisture recycling does not seem to be that important. There are more uh, atmospheric circulation changes are more important. While in ECR, the colors are much darker. So actually local feedbacks are much more important. Now, below this, this first row, we have again the changes, the changes that these uh, land cover changes cause. And in general, you see similar to what we had before, that cropland expansion is causing a decreased amount of moisture recycling. So an afforestation and irrigation expansion is causing an increased recycling. However, the patterns are also a bit varied across places and not always very clear. So it's there's a strong difference across the different models and across the different magnitudes of these effects. So I will conclude here and then I hope we have still time for some questions. Local signals from land cover and land management changes are generally consistent, at least in sign, across ESMs. Non-local signals from the land cover and land management chains have more intermodal spreads, although they are consistent for afforestation. And moisture fluxes are also clearly affected and are important to take into account in these analyses. And we hope that this information and these simulations can act as useful information in future land-based adaptation and mitigation policies. So there, with that, I thank you for your attention. I will include the links to the publications or the preprints which these results have been based on in the chat. So thank you everyone for choosing this breakout group. I'm happy to have a nice consortium of people to present about emulators to. Um, and I hope you find the presentation interesting. So yeah, I'll be talking about speeding up climate modeling with emulators um, and within context of the Lama Klima project, incorporation of land use effects and other developments. Um, so I'll start off by giving a small introduction to emulators, just so that we're all on the same level. And yeah, don't worry um, if you don't know anything, I think we'll get the basics um, out of the way in this subsection. So what are emulators? Well, when we try and uh, project future climate and explore different future climate scenarios, we usually um, employ climate models or earth system models. And earth system models constitute various components that represent different parts of the earth system, such as atmospheric physics, ocean circulation, pressure systems, biogeochemistry. And what happens is usually we explore the outcome of a range of forcing agents um, on the global temperature or local temperatures and these are usually affected by all these different systems that are within the Earth system. What emulators do, however, is that they sort of reduce the complexity of climate models by targeting specific key impact variables, so global temperature or local temperature in this case, and looking at the direct relationship that they have with forcing agents by parametrizing certain aspects of all of this otherwise part of climate models. Um, and to give an exact sort of definition, emulators reproduce relationships between forcing agents and key climate variables in a manner that's functionally identical to climate models. And you can imagine that given the reduced complexity, they are quite computationally efficient um, and also are uh, very useful in that way in ex uh, exploring and approximating the climate impacts out of different future scenarios. So just to give everyone an idea of exactly how computationally efficient emulators are, 
let's consider generating one climate model run under a future scenario. So usually going from pre-industrial levels, let's say 1870, up to the end of this century, so 2100. If we were to use a climate model, um, we would have to run these runs on a supercomputer. And usually the uh, runs take around weeks to months to generate. And also these climate models generate many climate variables, as you'd seen in the previous slide, it looks at all the different components of the Earth system, which means that we also explore a range of different variables, and this would also take a lot of storage space. However, an emulator could be run on, for example, this is my personal computer, a MacBook Pro M1, and it takes minutes to run, and it targets key impact relevant climate variables that can then be used for impact simulation studies or also attribution studies. So to summarize here, emulators enable agile exploration of outcomes for key impact relevant climate variables for any given scenario, and also allow generation of large ensembles of runs, allowing more robust assessment of uncertainties, since it only takes minutes to generate a run, so we can really just explore many different scenarios um, and also generate lots of different runs that provide large ensembles that are key for representing uncertainty. So here I will touch on some example applications of emulators. Um, as I think I mentioned before uh, in the pitch for this presentation, emulators can be used for some attribution cases. So in this case, um, there is a peer reviewed paper out there where emulators were used for rapid real time translation of climate impacts by the year 2030, so end of this decade, based on current nationally determined contributions or commitments. On the top panel of this figure, you can see the median change in temperature by the year 2030. And on the bottom panel, you can see the median probability for a hot year by the year 2030. And what the authors of this paper, so um, Boy Chatel, were trying to address was what would future climate impacts look like with and without the current top five emitters, which are China, the European Union, USA, India, and Russia. And what they did was a sort of experiment where they looked at what these two metrics would look like without the top five emitters since the IPCC was started in 1991 since the Paris Agreement in 2016, and as a reference, what it actually will look like with the current uh, nationally determined commitments. And you can see the stark difference in um, the likelihoods of hot years by 2030, as well as the median temperatures, which was made possible by using uh, an emulator to explore these. And furthermore, in the future, the emulator could again be used to reassess the nationally determined commitments. So that is quite a strong use case of these emulators. Another use is investigating changes in occurrences of future climate extremes. So you could ask yourself the question, how much more likely will an extremely hot year for Europe be by 2100? Um, and here you can see a paper by Kilkai, Jan Kilkai. I believe he's also in this breakout session. Uh, where he developed an emulator to represent um, extremely hot years and was able to then assess the anomaly in extremely hot years by 2100 in reference to the pre-industrial area of 1850 to 1900. And you can see the return period by the year 2100 for an extremely hot year over Europe under uh, different climate scenarios. So going from where we get almost six degrees Celsius of warming to where we get just about 1.7 degrees Celsius of warming. Um, and this was again made possible by emulators which allow generation of large ensembles so you can actually uh, assess uncertainties and quantify them and from that assess likelihoods of events. So these are some example applications. And now moving to the uses of emulators within the Lama Klima project. Um, I'll start off by introducing the framework uh, with which we sort of conceptualize the use of an emulator within the Lama Klima framework. Uh, 
the idea was that we wanted to start off by being able to emulate the monthly temperature responses to greenhouse gas emissions so that we could in a way explore the local monthly climate impacts um, to any emission trajectory in an agile manner. And this is the modular Earth system model emulator for spatially resolved temperatures. Um, and it also extends on previous work done at Boischatel, who also did the um, assessment of nationally determined commitments. So first there was the greenhouse gas emission emulations followed by emulating the local temperature responses to um, tree cover changes. And here we created the emulator timber, uh, which stands for tree cover change climate biophysical responses emulator. And it was inspired by some other projects that happened beforehand um, and also is extendable to looking at other land cover land management types such as irrigation and wood harvest. And I'll come back to this a bit later. But the idea was with these two emulators, we'd be able to jointly assess um, the combined effect of both land cover changes as well as greenhouse gas emissions on local temperatures. And from that, we would be able to generate joint um, pathways that explore both of these anthropogenic forcings and their implications under future climate scenarios. Some example results of um, MESMA M, so the emulator that explores the monthly temperature responses to greenhouse gas emissions. You can see here we show a high end emission scenario, SSB 5 8.5, for 2030 going to 2050 to 2070 and then 2100. And this shows sort of how it captures the monthly cycle. On the top panel, you can see the 5th, 50th, and 95th emulated quantile. So you can see that we can actually get a distribution. And here you can see the reference Earth system model that we are trying to approximate. And overall, you can see that there is a possibility to get the robust spread of likelihoods of temperatures under a high em uh, end emission scenario over here. Then here are some example results for timber where we were looking at the local temperature responses to tree cover change. Here I'm showing it for a given earth system model uh, and I show it for the end of century tree cover change that happens under the SSV 37.0. So on the far left, you can actually see what these tree cover changes are. Um, you can see there's quite a substantial deforestation over Central Africa and then a bit of reforestation over Europe um, and also East Asia. So with timber, we were able to assess the mean signal that would arise from these tree cover changes. And you can see them here for the months of January and July. Um, you can see that for July, the summer season, especially we see a lot of warming around uh, the area where it underwent tree cover change um, of deforestation for Central Africa. Furthermore, timber has an added feature of being able to quantify its confidence in the mean signal that it outputs. So here you can see maps of this and you can see that the darker, so the higher the confidence value, the more confident it is. And again, you can see that you can, um, timber is quite confident about the warming that would occur over Central Africa due to deforestation, especially for the summer months of July. And so these are some example results of our emulation of the temperature responses to tree cover change. And eventually this combined with the MESMA M results I showed on the previous slide would provide avenue for jointly exploring the temperature responses to greenhouse gas emission and land cover change trajectories. So moving on further, I will talk about some future developments that we've envisioned during uh, the Lama Klima project uh, and that are also uh, underway for some cases. So I mentioned this before that we would also like to explore the impacts from irrigation. Um, and in this way, we would like to extend timber to represent the local biogeophysically driven temperature responses to irrigation. Here you can see some example results for this. Again, for a given uh, system model, 
and here I'm showing it for the whole Eurasia continent in the month of June, so this month. Uh, what you can see is that I've aggregated the temperature responses uh, according to latitudinal bands, and on the x-axis is the irrigation amount that's implemented. The color bar represents the temperature responses, blue meaning cooling, red meaning warming, and you can see that as you go from higher latitudes to more Mediterranean latitudes, the cooling potential that you get for lower amounts of irrigation is more. And so that already shows that with the emulator, we are starting to capture some latitudinal patterns in irrigation um, and how that differs between different regions. Um, of course, this is preliminary work and we're working on uh, further verifying the emulator. Um, so yeah, we will keep everyone posted if they're interested on the um, process here. Another further development for emulators on a more general level would be to couple them with integrated assessment models, um, such as Magpie, which was presented by Florian, I believe, um, yeah, at the beginning of this workshop. And the idea here would be you would have a climate model and you'd have the integrated assessment model and there would be sort of a back and forth um, exchange of information between them. So the climate model emulator would provide climate impacts such as uh, wet bulb globe temperatures or other heat stress metrics. And the integrated assessment model would then from this respond and apply or uh, uh, provide deforestation rates or emission rates. And this would provide uh, an avenue for more robust exploration of future scenarios, um, as well as more agile exploration and development of future scenarios. And so that would be uh, another further development that um, would be worth exploring. And that is the end of my presentation. So I welcome any questions. Thanks and congratulations Ruti, for this clear presentation. Um, so I hope that was insightful for a few of you. Uh, I don't know if there are questions. I hear something, but I don't know who is speaking or trying to speak. Please speak up. We are small. Uh, no, sorry, I wasn't speaking. I was just saying yes. It was interesting. Sorry, I, I hadn't realized I'd left my uh, thing open. So that was uh, yeah, uh, a very nice talk. And, and maybe while I'm on, I, I will ask a question then. Yeah. So go ahead. Uh, yeah. So for example, in this last slide your main emphasis is on heat stress metrics does it then mean you're only looking at one sort of cause and effect chain and then others are not taken into account all kinds of feedbacks that could perhaps dampen your heat stress effect or um yeah so i think the first most simple way would be to uh, first synthesize these heat stress metrics um and of course, I don't think it's limited to only heat stress metrics. Um, I gave this as an example more because um, it's one avenue that we've already tried to explore. Um, but I think there are also other metrics that would be quite um, important. And that's a very good point that there could be some interaction. Um, so some sort of interaction of like the deforestation rate that then could affect the heat stress metric that was already provided to the IAM. So it's um, more about assessing this sort of coupling um, and trying to do it in a very, I guess, more interactive manner so that we can constantly also reassess what um, a given climate impact means for the sort of deforestation or emission rates and then um, readjust according to that. Yes, thank you. Very interesting. Thank you very much um, for the answer, Shruti. Are there further questions? Maybe no, from you may also write in the chat if you want to speak up. Um, 
So Shruti, you mentioned you you mostly talked about the, the Mesmer emulator, right? Um, yeah. But I believe there are also other emulators that are out there. Um, is that correct? So maybe could you specify um, the other initiatives or other projects or other communities that are working on, on emulator development? Yeah. What type of emulator development? So that people can get uh, an overview of yeah, what role it plays currently. Yeah, so um, I'd go back to this slide actually. Um, and here you can see that there's the possibility of going from a forcing agent, so potentially emissions um, to global temperature. And then from global temperature, you can go to local temperature or you could go directly. And so there's a lot of global emulators that actually focus on representing the relationship between greenhouse gas emissions and global temperature change. Um, so this would be emulators such as um, Magic or FAIR. And what they do is they usually parameterize exactly this equilibrium climate sensitivities and global scale parameters to then be able to assess global temperatures. What MESMA does is then it takes global temperatures and applies what is called pattern scaling, which is sort of just going from global temperatures and saying that grid point level temperatures have a linear relationship with the global temperature and trying to represent that by training on existing climate model runs. So essentially, when we would try and explore different greenhouse gas emission trajectories, we would first go from having a translation of the greenhouse gas emission trajectory to global temperatures using global emulators such as MAGIC or FAIR, from which we would translate the global temperatures to local temperature impacts using MESMA. Uh, of course, I, I would have to stress here that MESMA itself has its own assumptions of what uh, local temperature um, relates to global temperature as. So it assumes that it's a linear relationship. And it also assumes that any variability outside that relationship is mainly composed of short term um, spatially correlated features. To this end, there are other emulators that exist that can actually also consider what's larger modes of variability. So teleconnections um, and also periodic sort of occurrences of modes of variability such as the ENSO and so there are these other emulator uh, initiatives that target this um, and of course there's also other em emulator initiatives that can go directly from forcing agents to local temperatures and they tend to also incorporate some more uh, yeah knowledge of the emission trajectory um, and path dependencies over there yeah uh, but to this extent, um, most of them, of course, only look at greenhouse gas emissions as a forcing agent. And the timber emulator developed within the Lama Klima project is novel in that it also now is the first emulator to represent the effects of more localized anthropogenic forcings that occur from land cover land management, such as tree cover change or irrigation and wood harvest that happen on a more like local level, whereas greenhouse gas emission tends to have a direct forcing to global mean temperatures. Yeah. And why do we need this in the first place is because forests are not as simple as like a direct air capture plant that you might have heard about where you can just use um, electricity and some very sophisticated chemistry as well to capture carbon out of the atmosphere. But a tree or a forest is an actual living being. They're part of an ecosystem, a biome, and thus um, their mitigation component that we plan for, that we hope for, the carbon sequestration part, experiences some side effects or also potential, potential synergies because of that. And one of that is this local temperature change induced by biophysical effects. Now, in, in many studies concerned with these biophysical effects, um, you will almost always find a sentence similar to this one uh, that calls for these side effects to be taken account in planning 
in scenarios, in policy, and so on. However, there is hurdles to that, unfortunately, and I kind of see two issues arise when we bring these effects into the planning space. And the first is that these local temperature changes are difficult to compare with the carbon storage metric that we usually assign to forests because they're expressed in, yeah, in local temperature changes in, in Kelvin and degrees Celsius. And second, kind of emerging from that, it is also hard to assign a value, let's say in, in a dollar, a price tag to these um, temperature changes. And since climate action commonly is thought of as being motivated by a carbon price, especially in, in models concerned with that, um, it, we need to find a way of incorporating these local temperature changes in, in this value space, in the dollar space as well. So the idea that we are going to explore is the idea of forming a carbon equivalence of these local temperature changes to kind of bridge this gap, to form a link between um, the local temperature changes that we experience due to biophysical effects of afforestation, reforestation, and yeah, to, to then use them to inform um, our mitigation policy. In the first part though, I will briefly introduce you to the method and it's just one slide, I promise. And then we will look into the results um, of, of the two studies that I've mentioned already in the pitch. But first and foremost, the, um, the method slide. So we start off with, I hope you see the pointer as well. Yeah, I think you can. We start off with kind of what we have learned from other studies. Here I only use um, observation-based studies. So remote sensing studies or also um, like local tower measurements of what would happen if we would um, forest a non-forested area or kind of also the opposite uh, if, we, if we prohibit or conserve the deforestation of a currently forested area. And you see the temperature change, the local temperature change that would be exerted because of that. That is kind of our input data. So what we want to get from that is a carbon equivalent metric that we could use then to compare, for example, to the carbon sequestration potential of a forest and also to assess its value to mitigation in economic modeling or economic decision making. And the way how we bridge this gap from one, the observations to write what we kind of want to have in the decision space is that we use the framework of the transient climate response to cumulative emissions. And all that does is that it relates the local temperature change to the carbon that is necessary in the atmosphere to drive that change, to bring on that radiative forcing to induce that temperature change. So how much carbon it takes to warm up a certain area by so and so many degrees. And to get only the local um, effect size, we then also divide that by the um, global surface area. So then to reiterate why we actually do that, the potential benefit of forming such a carbon equivalence or carbon equivalent metric, with that, we can form this link, this, this chain between the local temperature change and also the carbon sequestration potential. And that allows us to combine these two things to get this more comprehensive climate effect of forestation. And also in a second step, it can provide us with the, the basis for an economic assessment, which can be really crucial, right? Um, we would really like to know about the climate potential of, of forests, but it's also important to see that afforestation reforestation stands in competition, not only with agricultural needs such as feed, food and fiber, but also in competition to other land-based mitigation, such as bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. But um, we will first go only into the climate space and jump into results of um, one of these 
two studies that I've mentioned. This one is published one and a half years ago in Nature Climate Change. And we are looking at this more comprehensive effect. Again, the link or the sum between the local temperature change and the carbon sequestration effect of, on the left-hand side, establishing new forests where forests currently are not. <laughs> and also the opposite of like conserving forests that are still standing and prohibiting kind of virtually the deforestation of these areas, of them not becoming um, cropland or grassland and so on. And you see the combined metric of both the carbon sequestration potential and also the carbon equivalent of the local temperature change displayed here in, in this um, legend down here. And what you might already see just by eye without any further assessment is that in the conservation space, there is much more yellow to be seen, much more of the very high beneficial mitigation sites if we leave these forests standing in comparison to potential afforestation reforestation sites. And maybe to just add one number to this is that if you look at all the reforestation afforestation sites that have been assessed on the left-hand side and you look at the 95th percentile of the highest mitigation potential or benefit to mitigation, it is actually lower than more than a third of the uh, mitigation potential of the conservation sites. And you can go further and look at the exact same plot, but as a histogram. So if um, left again, you would see the reforestation uh, um, action and right, you would see the conservation action. And the, we see in each histogram, of course, uh, how, how abundant or how, how many occurrences we have of a, of a mitigation potential on the x-axis. So if in a purely mitigation climate-driven mind, you would do afforestation, reforestation, you would, of course, begin at the very right-hand side here and pick the best plot with the highest mitigation potential and then work your way towards the left as you use up these most beneficial sites and need to revert to a little bit less beneficial sites, uh, again, in terms of this more comprehensive climate mitigation potential. And you do this until you kind of reach your goal, your effort. And I've, I've just, for an example, I've put in here the bond challenge, which hopes to restore 350 million hectares. And that's kind of the threshold. If you would purely motivate um, this afforestation or make the decision only based on this climate effect, these are kind of on the right-hand side, these would be the locations that you would need to pick in that sense. But of course, as I already introduced, the world is more complex. We also need to consider things other than only the climate effect of forests. And for example, we need to consider land use competition to agricultural production. And to heed that, we've implemented these CO2 equivalent effect into a land use model that was introduced to you. That is the magpie model. You've seen that with Florian in the beginning of the session. So magpie is already motivated forestation with a carbon price. And so we kind of just get to add in this additional local temperature effect that we've converted or translated to the carbon equivalents. So this forms us then an additional incentive if it's local cooling or a disincentive kind of a penalty if you experience local warming, which also happens, um, especially in, in high latitude forests. So we're going to jump into the um, into the results of that study. There's a study that we've published um, last year in environmental research letters. And here we are now kind of forming the link to this dollar value. That is the new link that we establish here. But to see the effect of the newly added uh, considered biophysical effects, again, we already had the sequestration potential in Magpie. We need to contrast them with the status quo or other, what was beforehand. So that's what I'm showing you here. It's just one very generic 
um, yeah, middle of the road SSP2 scenario aiming for a two degree world. And you see the afforestation action that was taken in Magpie globally throughout time. And we, we end up at the end of the century with about 150 million hectares of afforestation area established because of that. And you could also look at this in the space of these 12, 12 world regions that we have. And already you see um, most of that is actually done in what is uh, Latin America and also some of that in other Asia, which is mostly uh, Southeast Asia, actually. So now adding on top of that, these biophysical incentives or penalties, depending on, on the location, you would actually see a strong increase. Now in green, you see the additional area established under the same driving carbon price, but with this added incentive or penalty of the local temperature effects. And actually it's in this very scenario, it more than triples the viable mitigation driven afforestation area um, at the end of the century. However, we need to be very here that, yeah, I, I pointed out here, more than half of that area is added in just three world regions, which is Latin America, other Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And that of course would, yeah, force all the potential negative side effects, for example, produced by the land use competition to producing food, like um, the price on agricultural products. Also, you would focus that to these areas alone. And we go into more detail about that actually in the study, how that would change the driving carbon price. Uh, the price and agricultural production. So to end here, um, I summarize what we were able to learn um, with the help of this carbon equivalence. So we first of all formed this link between the local temperature change and the carbon sequestration potential, which allowed us to combine these two things and look at the more comprehensive effect of forests on the climate. That is the first study, Polish Nature Climate Change. And in the next step, we brought that also into the economic space of the MAGPI um, land use model, which then provided us the basis for a more economic assessment and that let us optimize the AR mitigation plans in that model that is also used uh, within the IPCC um, as 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 a integrated assessment model. So yeah, it was a it was a, my pleasure to introduce you to this carbon equivalence that we have um, established within uh, the Loma Clima Consortium, and I'm looking forward to not only the discussion but also the rest of the workshop. Thank you. We'll now um, conclude this this event and just provide you a few information on what to expect next from the Lama Klima project. So this is a timeline showing different uh, activities that took place among the second part of the Lama Klima project, starting with the scenario co-design workshop, which I've talked about at the beginning. And we are actually now at this final event, um, June 2023. This is when the project actually ends, but that doesn't mean everything ends here. Uh, of course, we have started some collaboration, which uh, have led to some publications and which will also um, lead to further publications as some analysis is still going on now. We will also have a last uh, newsletter for the Lama Klima project, which will be uh, sent, sent. So please, you can you can also uh, register for this newsletter uh, on the project webpage on the, on the Climate Analytics website if you're interested in getting this last update. You will also receive after um, this event, you will receive the materials with recordings, which will be uploaded online. Most of them in the next weeks, you'll receive a link and an update. Um, some presentations will be shared. Some presentations will not be shared as this, uh, they were um, showing actually um, material um, which is being generated at the moment. So, so publication in the making and therefore uh, not published yet. Um, and so for these presentations, uh, 
of these publications, the, the materials may not be shared. Um, if you contact us and let us know that you're nevertheless interested in having access to them once or being notified once the publication or published, please do so. And we will make sure to notify you once um, once the publications are, are out there um, so that you don't miss them. Yes, uh, we will also provide the contact list of the presenters and um, additional publications and accessible data will be updated on the project page as it becomes available as well. You have the list here of Lama Clima publications that are already out, or already um, consultable on the internet. But there are more to come with uh, some uh, publications on the implications of a land use patterns model with the MAGPIE for the global inequality and global sustainability scenarios with uh, our system models, CSM, ECF, and MPIESM. Um, so some publications coming to be expected on, on that topic as well as the consequences of these uh, land use patterns for adaptation mitigations and a few SDGs according to, again, the analysis done with the our system models for these two scenarios. And again, please check our project page for publications and further updates. Now, a few words about related projects and that you may want to follow um, to keep updated about the topic. Um, and some of these projects, some, actually in these projects, some of the scientific partners from Lama Clima are, are involved. So we have Ermi project, which is led by um, the UP in Brussels, which is looking at the irrigation impacts um, in the model intercomparison project, so a setup which is similar to Lama Clima, but so with um, intercomparison of different earth system models, but focusing this time on the effects of irrigation on climate. We also have the Forest Navigator project, um, which stands for Navigating Europe and Forest and Forest Bioeconomy Sustainably to EU Climate Neutrality, with um, LMU, so Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, as well as Climate Analytics being present in this project as well. Another European project, which is called Rescue for response of the health system to overshoot climate neutrality and negative emissions. That you may want to, to follow um, a few of the of the um, of the partners who are also present in this one, including Climate Analytics, uh, PIC, and um, also ETH. And um, ETH is also present in the last project, the Paris Agreement Overshooting Reversibility, Climate Impacts and Adaptation Needs, focusing on um, overshoot scenarios, overshoot pathways, as well as the implications for climate impacts and adaptation needs, um, which is coordinated by Humboldt University, University in Berlin, and in which climate ethics is also present 